Good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting for Monday, June 8th, 2019, uh, 2020, my mistake. Um, tonight we have, um, this is an out of uh, regular sequence meeting tonight. Um, we're gonna begin by organization, Pledge of Allegiance and a reading of the mail. At 7.30, we do have a public hearing regarding the soil removal permit application for Nine Air Road. Field development is the applicant. At 8 p.m., we will have members updates. At 8.15, we are going to have a uh, brief presentation by the PMBC regarding the uh, Ruben Hoare Library construction project. I will note that we're gonna take this subject out of order and hear that prior to the uh, hearing on the soil removal permit. At 8.15, we have a proposed um, form application for the use of Littleton Common. At 820, the town administrator will provide updates regarding the election warrant, the approval uh, for the uh, municipal vulnerability grant submission, 64 uh, Spectacle Pond Road soil removal permit update, and an uh, update on the Elder and Human Services Director hiring process. And then we will have um, a review of the meeting minutes for the Board of Selectmen, and then the meeting will adjourn. So we're gonna begin tonight by um, starting off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Knox. <clears throat> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic which it stands, stands. One, one, nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the public hearing is scheduled to begin at 7.30 p.m. Um, Mr. Layton, if you could just advise, do we need to open the hearing and then we can continue to um, article agenda item number five? We can proceed directly to, to five and then start the hearing after that. Okay, perfect. I see that Mr. Moore is on the call. If we could bring him into the meeting, that'd be great. Okay, just needs to turn on his mic. Okay, a little uh, challenge there, but I'm on. <laughs> I'm on, I think. We can hear you. Great. Madam Chairman and members of the board, I appreciate this opportunity to do uh, you know, present to you uh, the uh, uh, library GMP and cost uh, analysis for the, uh, that we're gonna vote on uh, at PMBC on Wednesday night. Um, Joe, do you have that uh, slide that you can bring up that I sent you or not? Are you, are you looking for specifically the spreadsheet? Yeah. Okay, let me. I have it up, uh, I can share. Okay, great. So the um, the dollar value highlighted in orange is the uh, guaranteed maximum price from the contractor. Uh, <clears throat> the additional fees under that are the soft costs that uh, you know are outside the construction costs. The total construction cost. Uh, of the project, if we can scroll down to the bottom, uh, currently exceed uh, the uh, budget by about three hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars. The, from what I understand, and I can let uh, others talk to this, the um, library trustees have offered to uh, put in escrow four hundred thousand dollars to bring it, the uh, budget up to 15 million. So the total all in cost of 14,959,000 and change gives us um, $40,000 under the combined budget. Now, having said that, uh, there is about $730,000 in combined contingency built into this uh, this uh, budget. Uh, the owner contingency is $365,518. Uh, 
and the contractor contingency, which is their risk in case they missed anything uh, during the bid process is $364,283, which is part of the CM uh, budget. <clears throat> so between the um, contingency and the $40,000 under budget, we're approximately $770,000 in, um, you know, contingency and other uh, savings. None of this work has been actually purchased or bought out. So there's, we assume uh, additional savings to be realized uh, during the buyout process. So since we're gonna vote on this uh, Wednesday night, I thought it was incumbent and I was talking to Nina and Joe that uh, it would be good for me to come and present this to the board uh, for information uh, and, you know, answer any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Appreciate, appreciate the update. I'm going to ask if any members of the board have any questions. Madam Chair, if I might jump in. Sure. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for the presentation. So if you're saying that there's about a $700,000 contingency, we're, we're roughly at 20% plus minus, which is a good good spot to be in, correct? Actually, the, the uh, Chuck, the contingency, the combined contingencies only amount to about 6%, which is a little bit on the low side. Yeah, it is. I, was, yeah. I, I, I thought it was on the low side. And then after this presentation, when you were saying 700,000, I was, I was thinking 700 of um, 14 million. It, it turns out to be about 15 million. But uh, at any rate, I, I think I did the math right because I anticipated the uh, question. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's a good question. And uh, it's still a little bit on the low side, but we're anticipating we're going to uh, realize some savings in the buyout. Value engineering and whatnot. No, not necessarily. But we, we've gone through the VE process. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, prices in from all the contractors. Um, oh, the actuals. Of, yeah. And, uh, you know, now the contractor has to go in and get, you know, uh, best and final pricing. Okay. Is that what, is that what you mean by the buyout process, yeah. Steve? Yes. Yeah. Okay. They go through and they de-scope and make sure that each contractor <laughs> has, uh, each low bid contractor has all the uh, scope in their budget. And then, you know, if they have something that somebody else has, or if they're missing something, then they, um, you know, they, they, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they balance the, uh, they go through a reconciliation process. And in your experience, that reconciliation process results in it, overall it lower rather than higher number. It seems like it could go either way to me. Um, the, so, well, it could, uh, generally, <laughs> uh, there are some savings realized. Okay. Okay, great. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, perfect. Sorry about my math hour. No worries. Right. Uh, you know, quite frankly, Chuck, I did the same thing, and I said that can't be right. <laughs> yeah, as as I was as I was doing the math in my head when you were speaking to Chase, I I realized I was a dopey. Yeah, no, easy. I, to did, do. I did. I did want to know what the contingency was, but seven hundred for a fifteen million dollar project is uh, yeah, it's that's actually less than six percent. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> All right, great. Thank you very much, Steve. My pleasure. Good luck Wednesday, Steve. Thanks very much. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank you, you too. too. Okay, perfect. So we're going to move on now to the public hearing regarding the soil removal permit for Nine Air Road. So we have two proposed motions regarding opening of the public hearing. Um, my recommendation is that we uh, vote to open the soil removal hearing and waive the reading of the legal notice. I don't know if the board has a preference with respect to that or not. So moved. Second. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. We're going to open the soil removal hearing relating to Nine Air Road and waive the reading of the public hearing notice has been waived by the board.
So we have Tom Herring. Do you need Excuse to do me? a roll call vote? Yes. Oh, certainly. My mistake. Thank, thanks, Judy. Okay, all those in favor? Mr. Knox? I don't think I'm voting it is. Okay. Mr. Gerbig? Aye. Mr. DeCost? Chuck's aye. Mr. Glavy? Aye. And Cindy Napoli is aye. Okay, the hearing is now open. And we see that we have um, Attorney Platt on the line. Um, I believe Attorney McKay as well. We have Town Council Tom Harrington on the call as well. And I see that we have Michael and Janet Field joining us as well. So to begin this, um, I, get, I think I'm gonna ask Chase to lead us off. I know that um, you have been um, hands-on with this <clears throat> situation. So if you could give the board an update um, sure. regarding discussions and, and where we're at at this moment, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so I guess where we're at is that we've, we now have a new soil removal permit in front of us. Uh, as you recall, the soil removal permit that we had evaluated and uh, as of a few weeks ago um, was withdrawn without, preju without prejudice. And so um, this revised application or new application rather uh, entirely takes the place of that. Um, this application is when I met with the fields uh, at their site, I suggested to them that it would be wise for them to submit an application that addressed some of the comments that the board had on their initial application. That is uh, through town council's office, we submitted a request for additional information based on the first soil removal permit. Um, this new application uh, attempts to address most of those things. Um, and so I, I think it probably makes the most sense for the board to really start afresh here um, without necessarily recreating every little bit of uh, background and discussion that we had. So what I've done uh, at the behest of the board is work with field development and their council to hammer out a settlement related to the lawsuit that the town brought against field development um, that principally asked them to bring forward a soil removal permit, um, as well as discuss with them sort of what, what the board would be looking for in the soil removal permit that they did bring forward. Um, simultaneously, have uh, done site visits on both the Nine Air Road side of the property line to take a look at the operations that were going on there. Did that with field development. I've also looked at the site from the abutter side of things and been sort of up on top of the hill uh, and have met with abutters as well. Um, I, I guess if you'll indulge, Madam Chair, it, 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 I think our conversation can be a lot more productive if I give it a little bit of structure. Um, and the structure that I'd like to give it is, is sort of twofold. One is historical and one is kind of what the board is looking for here. Um, the historical nature of this is that the the way the regs are written and the way that the regs have been interpreted have been interpreted um, is really what it comes down to is a, a disagreement about what soil incidental to construction of these houses means. And the nature of that is such that the fields received an opinion from our building department that what they were doing was incidental to construction. And so consequently they started to do the work um, at which time they were informed that what they were doing is subject to a soil removal permit um, and not entirely incidental to construction. Um, I've, I'm very clear that I, I think 160,000 yards defies the definition of incidental. And yet we also have to recognize that um, the town doesn't formally define what incidental is either qualitatively or quantitatively. So that puts us in a position of both reviewing the plan, understanding what's going on, frankly, in some ways acting almost as a planning board type operation here, um, as well as addressing abutter issues, questions, complaints. So some of the major abutter issues that we've had to deal with uh, include dust and noise mitigation, a concern about restoration of the site, and the timeline on which this work is going to be completed. Um, 
so in all of that, here's where I've gotten to on it. Um, there is a good chunk of this 160,000 cubic yards that the field, the field development is looking to remove from the site that I would agree is in fact, um, it, it pains me to say this, related to the construction. I almost can't even say incidental here because it just doesn't, I understand that's the defining word, um, and, and the town needs to work on remedying that. But when I look at this, it's quite clear to me that um, based on what they've put forward, some of the things that the, that the choices that they've made and the amount of material that needs to be excavated is consistent with their right to develop their property. Um, I guess what I seek to understand here tonight is exactly where that threshold is. Um, I think I've shared with members of the uh, of the board and the town administrator that um, certainly at a minimum 100,000 cubic yards is related to the construction. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean the rest isn't, but I, I want to understand what the rest of that is. So um, with that, the, the way I got to sort of that quantity of material is looking at our zoning regs, looking at our um, building code, so on and so forth. And frankly, the fact of the matter is that if you're going to develop this site and put three houses on it, which I agree is uh, available to them by right, um, you would have to bring the grade down substantially. Um, there's no other viable way of doing that. So I'd, I'd like to, it, tonight, in terms of the construct that we're looking at, really understand that we're talking about two different buckets of soil here. One is the amount of soil that is required to do the work that is required to build three houses on the lot. Another, the other bucket of soil is that amount of soil that is in excess of that, that the field, the field development would still like to remove. And I think if we understand that those two constructs are really hard to tease apart on this site in terms of which scoop of dirt fits, in, fits into which bucket, but still those two buckets are sort of our defining understanding. Um, hopefully we reach a more productive conversation. So that, with that, it, does that address sort of the, the preamble that you wanted, Madam Chair, and sort of how we got to where we are? It does, thank you very much. Okay, so moving forward, we have um, been discussing a proposed agreement um, with the fields as well as the permit itself. Since we've been talking about the permit itself, I'm wondering if uh, the board, any members of the board had any comments on the proposed uh, permit that was presented to us this afternoon. I have plenty, Madam Chair. I, I don't know if you want me to go first or last. Uh, sure, you can go first, Chase. Okay, so we're talking specifically of the, the permit application. Correct. Um, so uh, there are a few questions that I wanted to address here. Um, and excuse me if they seem very detailed, but I, I think some of these details are important. Um, one is related to the noise monitoring. And I wanted to know if the applicants could in fact confirm because the, the memo that they provided with the application was not totally clear um, that the screener was in fact operating when the, uh, when the noise, when the noise monitoring was done. Uh, what the, the application says is that the excavation operations were ongoing. And I, ju I just want to make sure that the screener was part of that process when they took the active measurements. Can anyone respond to that question? Yeah. If that's that, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. This is, I'm Jennifer Platt of Anderson Krieger. I'm here on behalf of the fields along with David McKay of Merrick and O'Connell. Um, my understanding is yes, the screeners were operating. We wanted to have a, um, a full uh, representative operation so the uh, so tech environmental could test our conditions our operating conditions against the background conditions um, I have Janet and Michael field are here as well if I'm incorrect please please correct me on that 
we just wanted to clarify the fact that they were in fact working in the relocated out towards the front of the street location. Uh, right, in the new location that you've proposed for the yeah. screener. Yep. Yeah. So they did they did testing on and off for those two locations. And, and there was no significant, there was no change in the, uh, um, it didn't increase over the allowable special the results. Yeah. So anyway, they were, it was in the new location. I just wanted to make sure we're clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and with that, it, so one of the objectives that I have with this is addressing and, and ensuring, I, I guess my principal objective here is addressing and, and ensuring that the abutters are as protected as possible. Um, is it correct that the screener is probably the loudest piece of equipment outside of the backup beepers on the equipment? That is correct. Okay. Um, so one of the elements that I'd like to discuss with the applicants is if it would be possible to operate the screener in a more constrained number of hours. Um, technically, you uh, can work, I think, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., but I also understand, I understand that the noise measurements don't exceed the thresholds even on the top of the berm around the site, and I appreciate that. Um, but I think you would have to acknowledge that we're right on the threshold of those. Um, and so if it would be possible to operate the screener, say, no later or no earlier than a reasonable time, 8.30 a.m., um, that we could provide a little bit more protectiveness for the abutters. Um, and I think that would be helpful to them. What do we tell you for? Um, I think that's something we could definitely consider. The morning is the harder part because you know how construction is. They like to get in there and get going early. Mm -hmm. But um, I so, certainly, I think we could improve on seven. So like whether it be 8.30, I don't, we'd definitely have to check with yeah. Onyx. Okay. Um, but no later than four. But we could, I think we could move the five up to four. Okay, I, I think that would be helpful to folks as well. And and to be perfectly clear, and I made it very clear to the abutters, I, I'm not willing to ask you to do anything relative to the backup beepers, which are the single loudest part of this. Yes, um, they are very loud. Th sure. it, it, and there's really no way to get around that that is protective of workers. So it. Yep. So now we're going to go to the, the next most challenging thing. So if you could look at what hours would be reasonable, um, I would be interested in, in knowing if we could constrain those hours. I mean, I think that without, you know, too much pushing, we could push them to 7.30. I don't know. Eight, how about 8 to 4? Just 8 to 4. Oh, you commit to me? Yep. I mean, that, that works for me. Um, You're willing to commit to that? 8 to 4, yep. Screener okay. hours 8 to 4. I'm writing it down. Okay. And, and I think here where we would we would revise the application to state that probably in no screening on Saturday. Yeah, there's an there's an yeah, I saw that and I appreciate that. And I think the abutters will appreciate that as well. Um, okay. Um, that's addressed. Well, we'll figure out exactly where to address that. Never mind. Um, next question I had was you've put forward that uh, you're committing to undergoing a dust mitigation and monitoring program. Um, I generally don't have any complaints about the timing and locations of that program. I do want to understand, I want to verify that the equipment that you've put forward is capable of measuring dust concentrations on the order of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, which is the basis that you've provided for uh, reasonable dust levels at the site. Um, those ambient air quality standards for PM10 are 150 micrograms per liter, or I'm sorry, 150 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, the monitoring equipment that you have certainly includes that, but it includes far higher than that as well. So I wanted to make sure that you could get reasonable resolution uh, up to the national ambient air quality standard. So we have tech environmental, as you know, Chase, um, involved as our environmental consultant here, both for noise remediation and dust remediation. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, if that's something that the equipment is capable of doing, and I believe you're saying that it is, we're happy to have them test at that level. We okay. don't have them here on this call to uh, to verify what they're what typically does, but we we look to them as the expert both in testing and then helping us come up with with reasonable responses to help address any anything that they might um, flag as an issue. Okay, I, I I think that's that's reasonable. Um, I appreciate the 150 micrograms per cubic meter is a reasonable basis on which to define action levels. And that's uh, that's laid out in the settlement between the, the draft settlement between the town and field development. Um, and in my experience is, uh, is an achievable standard to hit. So it, it, as long as you could verify that your program would be able to achieve those measurement thresholds, then I'm generally comfortable with it, with this one other qualifier. And that's that, um, I didn't see a discussion, although it's possible I missed it, that those monitoring reports would be submitted to the town in some context. Um, and so I think the town would be interested in seeing those on a weekly, bi-weekly, some kind of basis so that we could verify independently on behalf of the abutters that, that we're meeting the thresholds. So of course those can be submitted. I think it would be bi-weekly. Or... I can live with that. Um, okay, I, I apologize to everybody else for going through these pecune details, but I, I think it's really important to get all of this down and understand exactly what this looks like. Um, the next question that I have is with respect to the ultimate extents of the work. Um, one of the things, it's, it's a wide open site. One of the things that I'm concerned about is the hitting the extent of excavation and not over excavating. And I think there are a couple of ways that we could potentially address this that are not particularly cumbersome to either the applicant or the town. Um, the way I would be most interested in seeing it is if the applicants would be willing to have a, perhaps a point surveyed on an adjacent sidewall someplace so that when the building inspector is there or the, the um, perhaps the ATA is there, someone from the town is there, we can see, we have some known marker of an elevation point on the sidewalls. So that when, let's say the building commissioner is standing there, he knows that the marker is at, I don't know, 240 feet. And we know that we're excavating down to 225 feet. He has a reasonable sense of the elevation that the site is at currently so that we can avoid over excavating. Um, this would be, I think, relatively, unburdensome, minimally burdensome to the applicants. It just involves having a surveyor go out and, and put in a stake at a known elevation, um, something that would be generally visible. It may have to be replaced once or twice, but that shouldn't be a, a major issue. And that would then allow the town to know where we are relative to the extents of excavation and prevent that over excavation. Is that, I, I think there are other technical approaches to that and I would be more than happy to entertain those, but something that, that gives us some bounds. If it's okay, if I can, can I address that, Jennifer? Absolutely. I think it's a great idea. I think that we should have Ducharme and Dillis come out and install a benchmark that is great, just a great um, tool and, for and everybody on site. Well, there probably is one, but it's probably a little nail at this point. We can have it be a little bit more. 245. All right, Greg, Greg, say yes, wave if it's okay, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes, ma'am. We can. Yes, sir. We can do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, and um, and I think that will that will put some folks at ease to know that we're we're only going to the design extent here. Um, okay. A few other detailed questions. Um, okay. Now, it, if it's okay with the applicant, I, I wouldn't mind to be able to ask Greg a few questions, although I understand if you would prefer that they come through you, um, uh, Ms. Platt. Um, Thank you, Mr. Gerbeg. Um, that's quite all right. I, actually, we do want to have our engineer have an opportunity to talk about why the site is designed the way it is, why the soil has to come out. And I'm, I'm sure that's our, those are on your list of questions as well. So 
Um, I was actually hoping to to simply invite Mr. Roy to to answer that question broadly and give us his narrative of it um, and help us understand how we got to this design. Sure. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Thanks uh, for your time. I appreciate the question. Um, so I think I pro we provided a letter uh, to to the board. I'm not sure if you've had an an opportunity to read that, but from from me with a little bit of information relative to that question, but I'll try and I'll try and flush it out a little bit more. Um, the site is nominally about 40 plus feet above the elevation of the road, and I think you're all pretty familiar with 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 the embankment uh, that that exists uh, existed. Um, and that embankment's about a 55% very steep slope, uh, uh, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so the frontage access to the three lots that we're proposing is obviously accessed from air road. And so access to the site uh, is naturally uh, from air road. Um, so one of the design constraints right off the bat was to uh, get driveways in a safe manner um, from air road right away up up to where the the house lots were going to go uh, where the houses needed to go on the site um, so we look to um, actually minimize the amount of fill believe it or not um, by having those driveways as steep as we thought we could possibly um, possibly get away with the lot one two driveway um, and I'm not going to call it a shared driveway because shared driveway is defined in a defined term in your in your bylaw but the the driveway that services lots one and two um, is after a leveling area when you when you um, when you enter the driveway um, goes up at a 12 percent slope until you get to the um, until you get to the proposed houses so we use that analysis on those to, to sort of set the grades on those two lots. Um, lot one, we actually put the house in the side slope. I'm not sure if you have the plan in front of you, but if you can imagine it, we, we put the house on lot one actually in the side slope and we did a drive under, which is not very typical of this day and age. Um, but we did that so that it would work better with the slope coming off of the abutting property. Uh, that slope was actually um, that slope, as well as the slope on the back of the site, um, was designed at a three to one uh, versus a steeper two to one, which would be allowed. But we we, we relaxed that slope on those two um, on those two um, on those two areas. Um, and then similarly on the lot three driveway, the um, we came up at a, a steeper uh, grade. We actually went down a little bit there. We it's no secret that we need to take that material needs to come off the site. Um, we had, we had anticipated that being used uh, for that um, a lot of that work. Um, so we designed that at an eight uh, percent slope, which we think is um, about the limit of what we'd like to see for um, the, you know the larger construction vehicles. Um, and similarly, the house is sited up in the back. Lot three is a lot was intended by the fields to be a larger lot. Um, and so we designed that lot with the house sitting back off the road. Um, the drainage also impacted the site. Um, in the pre-existing case, the if you were to traverse the slope and go up to the top, um, to the, to the top level area, there was actually, a, there's actually a drainage break that goes through there with the front portion of the site draining towards air road and quite a bit of the back of the site actually uh, stayed in the in the site. There was there's some valley, kind of shallow valleys that exist there. Um, so we we needed to maintain. Uh, we can only um, discharge. Um, we can only discharge under the post-developed condition. We can only discharge what was discharged under the pre-developed condition. So we needed to be careful um, to send only that amount of water that is. We can only send so much water. To air road, um, so we've actually designed some uh, drainage features along air road to accommodate that to make sure that those levels uh, we're not going to cause any off-street flooding on air road. Um, but I, I say that more 
uh, to address the lot three grading, there's actually a depression that we created there uh, of, of a few feet. It's not a, it's not an extremely deep, uh, deep depression, but that was to um, mimic the pre-developed drainage patterns on the site. Uh, so that's going to take the flow from the back parts of lots one and two and lots three and infiltrate that on site. The balance of it will be flowing towards their road and will be mitigated through the through the swales that we have um, designed on the road, on the driveways, and uh, ultimately make it to the um, stormwater management areas that we have at the base of the hill. So um, lots one and two are the top of foundations were set. Uh, I think lot one is about 26 feet above the road. Lot two is set about 18 feet above the road. So we really tried to, you know, we tried to get as high on the site as we can um, so that we could, we could kind of soften the blow a little bit uh, on, on that. Um, and similarly, lot three, I believe, is, is about the same. It's about 20, 20 normally 20 feet or so. Um, like I said, we, um, we designed the side slopes that were adjacent to the residential properties as one on three side slopes, um, which is a, so, a shallower slope uh, versus the two to one that we're actually proposing on the side of, um, uh, aja on the uh, westerly side of the site, which is adjacent to uh, commercially zoned land or industrial. Um, I think, I'm not sure if that answered your question, Chase, but I, I tried to. No, I, I think it does. And, and I guess, there are a few design issues here that I think result in having to take more material out that I 100% understand and get. Um, the first is I completely agree with the fact that these driveways need to be more or less perpendicular to air road. Um, that it, it would create a remarkable public safety issue to have them come in at an oblique angle of some degree. Um, both for the, the residents as well as for those traversing an air road. Um, and so, you know, it, when I first looked at this, some sort of approach where you switch back up the hill seemed to be viable. But uh, frankly, the, the more I look at this and the more I look at adjacent lots, an approach that comes straight out the road seems to be the only viable approach. Um, the other element that I very much understand is the driveway and slopes associated with lots one and two. What I struggle with, and this comes back to that construct of two different, uh, two different buckets of soil here. What I struggle with is the slope and length of the driveway for lot one. And let me tell you why I struggle with that and then maybe you can help me understand it a little bit better. Um, the driveway to lots one and two is at a 12% grade. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And the driveway to lot one is at an 8% grade, correct? Correct. So it would be true, right? If, if we went with a steeper slope on lot three, we would ultimately set, we would ultimately be able to set the top of foundation for the building higher up, right? So why not go with a steeper well, slope on that driveway when it's, yeah. it's perfectly fine to do it for lots one and two, but not for lot three. So in theory, you're correct. This all kind of, the grading does have to blend with one another as well because of the amount of material that needs to come out. Lot one grading relates to lot two grading. Lot two grading relates to lot, lot one and three and twice and everything, everything inter, interplays. So where lot, where the lot three driveway goes past the lot the lot three foundation, if you, if you, if, I don't know if you can see that, if you're looking mm -hmm. at it or not, but uh, we're a little bit constrained there as well. I mean, you can you know, you can only get so high there before you have the, you know, before you have that house, you know, you have a, you get, you start getting into a grading conflict with that house. And um, now we don't have a barn to the, to the West of it. And so it, it seems to well, me yeah, that, that we're, that, we're not constrained be, there any longer. Well, not to the barn, but to the, to the proposed house, the future house on lot two is what I mean, ultimately, uh, you know. No, I, I guess what I'm suggesting is that you could reduce the amount of fill by making that driveway farther from the house on lot two and ultimately resulting in a higher elevation for the top of foundation associated with lot number three. Does that make some sense? Well, 
<laughs> yeah, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here. Do we, um, if uh, maybe I could just query, uh, I mean, I think by a lot of states, so I'm just going to tell you, we had initially actually, I, let me give you a little bit more insight on, as to lot into lot three. We had actually initially done a layout um, that would have a fourth lot. So you could actually put a fourth lot, frontage lot, to the west of the lot three driveway there. Mm -hmm. And that would be similar uh, to uh, the lot one and two situation. It would, sh it would be shared, quote unquote, with, um, with, lots, with lot three. So I don't think we want to preclude that. Um, and, and again, anybody from the development team here that wants to jump in, if I'm getting too far afield here, but uh, I did, I do, I do think it's it's of, of note to answer your question, Chase. Was that we did have a we did have another um, we we did have another lot in there that is is certainly possible and and is allowable by by right. The A and R was before. The A and R you could have been a four lot A and R plan, correct? Yes. See, my my understanding looking at it is that a fourth lot doesn't have the necessary amount of frontage and would require a special permit. It, that, have, if I may, uh, Chase, uh, under the bylaws, you would require a special permit, but it's, or, I'm sorry, not a special permit. You would require endorsement, but it's, it's endorsement to the same extent as on an A&R. So as long as the plan provides adequate um, area and meets other dimensional requirements in the zoning bylaws, then the planning board is required to endorse that, that plan with a limited frontage lot. So this property would accommodate four lots. And um, the original plan had been to do three, and that's what has been presented. Uh, we have reserved the right to come in and, and do four it would not require any additional soil removal given this driveway would allow access to those, that additional lot. Uh, and to be perfectly candid, given that this has taken more time and more expense to get this project going, it's something that, that we need to, to be able to reserve. Um, if, if I may jump in as well, the, the, the one thing that I might invent, um, <clears throat> excuse me, invite Greg to address a little bit is the question of the amount, the, the kind of differences that we're talking about um, in the driveway grades. If you do the kinds of things that you're talking about, um, Mr. Gerbig, in terms of reducing the amount of fill that otherwise gets removed from the site, um, and, and the reality is that, um, you know, I think you can make small tweaks to the overall design of the project, but that um, they don't really have a material um, effect on the amount of soil that needs to be removed. So I, I think your point is well taken to the extent that, um, you know, if, if you were to move the houses around um, slightly, you, 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 you might alter the 160 number, but you're not gonna alter it in any way that I think is, um, you know, really material to the, to the design of the project. Well, it's material to the design of the project because um, it, e even a small reduction in the amount of soil that gets removed, um, you know, negatively impacts the feasibility of the project. Um, and, but you know, when you're, when you're, when you, when you talk about making adjustments, to the amount of soil that gets removed, you know, even a small amount and, and, um, Mr. Roy addressed this in his supplemental letter that we submitted to the board, because we, we had a sense that this question was going to come up. Um, you know, what happens if you change, you know, 160, um, to, uh, 135, um, and even that is only, I think, you know, a 15% reduction. Um, in the amount of soil that gets removed, but it has a dramatic effect on the driveway slopes and 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 what that project looks like. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe Greg can comment a little bit um, more on that because I think it I think it I think it goes to the specific question that you're asking, which is, look, you move things around a little bit, you know, can't you reduce the amount of soil that you're you're taking off the site? 
I agree, Mr. McKay. I think that does get, um, that ultimately gets straight to the heart of the matter. So it, Greg, if you wouldn't mind, I, I, I would very much invite that uh, narrative to help us understand your position. Yeah, well, um, well, you, you, you summarize, you must play an engineer on TV or something there. But anyway, you, you summarize it pretty good, pretty well. I mean, I, so I did analysis. I was asked to do an analysis of what would happen if we, you know, what impacts to the site would, would happen if we, what impacts would be generated if we were, if someone said, you know, if we were to reduce the amount of cubic yardage by 25,000 cubic yards, nominally speaking, um, it's about a foot uh, every twenty, every twenty, every foot generates about twenty five hundred cubic yards. Okay, so you kind of get that in your, in your head, and that's just a quick math problem. Anybody can do that. You length times width, times it's a volume equation, and it obviously changes as you go up a little bit. But that's that's so. If you were to, um, when I did the the rough numbers, you'd have to raise everything by about ten feet to. Um, to reduce the amount of material coming off site by 25,000 yards. And uh, some of the things that happen on that, so for example, on lots one and two, um, I mean, I've already, I've already mentioned that, you know, we have that driveway designed at a 12% slope, which, which to me is about the maximum I'll do um, on, a, on a residential driveway. I mean, you start getting into problems with fire truck access and, you know, 12% uh, is a pretty steep driveway. Uh, so if you were to hold that 12% and accommodate the additional 10 vertical feet, you can't, you can now not put the, you can now not put the buildings on the lot because you have to increase the length of the driveways by uh, 83 feet, I think it is. Uh, and so can you, I you interrupt you while you're, you're making that point? Does that also yeah. shift the hydrologic break in the site such that it, you could... That, and yeah. push more water towards area. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's sort of my next my next point. So, from a drainage standpoint, it it makes it it, it hurts you in two ways. You push more tributary. We, we call them the sorry if I'm boring anybody, but we call it tributary area the area that drains to a design point. So in this case, the area that drains towards Air Road, it 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 makes that larger and it creates more impervious area on the site on, on it, within that area that's draining. So it it becomes a a problem. Uh, relative to that, we, you know, that w there would have to be some accommodations made for that because we've, we've set those, you know, we've designed those uh, stormwater management um, facilities to, uh, to match that, that runoff. Um, so that, that gives you, so it really, it, you know, it, it, I, I can appreciate your point, you know, that, you know, at face value, you might, you might be struggling with it, but um, to attorney McKay's point, it's it really impacts it quite a bit when you start doing the analysis when you start looking at and, and so by the way if you're going to keep the houses in the same location and just steepen the driveway you'd be up closer to a 20 percent slope on on portions of that driveway which is just not in the realm of of some especially coming down a hill on a uh, on a uh, you know on onto air road and needing to accommodate uh, vehicles so it really makes a pretty significant difference. Okay. No, I appreciate that. And um, Greg, I, I think you and I are probably putting everyone else on this call to sleep. So um, <laughs> let me um, let me see if I can expedite this a little bit. Um, I wouldn't, I, I know the applicant would really like us to complete the soil removal permit tonight. Um, I, I guess I, I would still like to take a look at a couple of things based on what Greg has pointed out. And I wouldn't mind an opportunity to have a, uh, if attorneys need to be present, fine. It doesn't matter to me, a one-on-one a -on -one discussion with Greg for a few minutes on some of the technical things here. Um, if the applicant was willing to entertain the idea of some sort of partial approval of the volume of material so that in the interim, uh, work can commence on the site while the board gets comfortable with the rest of the technical details to support the total volume. Um, I, I think I could get behind that. I, and I don't mean to speak for the rest of my colleagues here, but um, but I think that may be a way of, of doing this more expeditiously. Okay, thank you, Chase. Um, <clears throat> so, 
in an effort to try to move forward, well, actually, let, let me ask the other board members if they want to respond to um, the proposal just presented by Chase. Mr. I'll jump in. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll jump in. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'm actually just going to toss my notes aside. <laughs> um, based upon the application that came through and in, in the um, the settlement agreement that was worked on between the attorneys. I know that uh, Greg and his firm have done a lot of work on this. Um, we've all seen plans. We've all seen as uh, um, drawings and whatnot. Um, one question I do have just to kind of clarify the benchmark. I think Janet used the term benchmark when Chase was talking about have uh, you know, a, a yardstick uh, on the site so that uh, the town can go out there and, and see how much earth has been removed. I would, I would imagine the yardstick, in fact, could be the, um, Greg used the term, top of the foundation, um, coupled with an as-built, essentially, whoever that professional, I'm assuming it's our building commission that's going to go out there and, and do the, um, the visits for us to determine how much earth has been removed. I would, I would offer up, that would be our benchmark that we use the, the foundations. I mean, if there is something that's used in the industry where you have this giant yardstick on the, on the side of the... The, the site, then, then that's fine as well if, if that's something that the developer is willing to do. But I think with the construction that's going on, we know what the topo is, we know what the top of the foundation is, and we can kind of use the as to determine, you know, what where we're at as far as earth removal. Um, as for uh, Chase's question relative to uh, moving forward tonight, with uh, some caveats with, with some additional information needed. I'm comfortable with um, getting the information that we need. We've, we've had a number of opportunities to take a look at different renditions of the settlement agreement. If, um, if both parties are in agreement with what's on the settlement agreement with maybe just uh, some, some areas that um, I think we've had some, some areas of disagreement. And I think if we can just hammer out those areas of disagreement tonight, um, if there were some conditions that we wanted to put in chase, I'd be, I'd be comfortable with putting the conditions in, but frankly, I think it's, it's, um, something that I'd, I'd prefer to see, um, issued this evening. I, I'm essentially in agreement with that, Madam Chair. Uh, I, um, I thought I understood the proposal when I read it and then it was explained to me and I don't know, maybe they, uh, the two engineers, uh, lost me somewhere. No, I, I, uh, I, I, um, I think it's a, uh, reasonable approach to a lot of, uh, tricky, um, problems within our limited scope. I think it, uh, serves the interests of protecting the town. We have, we have, uh, you know, we have the ability to monitor and enforce going forward. So I'm uh, perfectly comfortable in, in uh, uh, reaching an agreement tonight uh, that allows permit to emanate. And if there's some details that need to be hammered out afterward, that's fine. Mr. Knox, did you have any comments? I think he's stay, stepping out of this, isn't he? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Correct. So just to recap, um, with respect to the permit application, just to review um, what was discussed uh, by Mr. Gerbeg between um, the fields is that the hour of op uh, the screening um, operation of hours um, will be changed from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, the dust mitigation um, plan in place. Um, will comply with the uh, national ambient air quality standards, which um, is in the which is in the agreement already. I, right. My concern was that their equipment may or may not be able to measure at that level, but the right. settlement says that they that that's the threshold. So, uh, not to be cavalier about it, but I actually don't care if their equipment does or doesn't meet those. If it if they're not able to use that to meet those standards, then they need different equipment. Um, but what I care about is the standard that they're expected to meet. And I have no reason to believe their equipment can't. I just wanted to verify it. I appreciate right. the clarification. I didn't understand that. Okay. And then um, bi-weekly reporting will be provided to the town of the screening operations. Correction. Yeah. Of the, uh, yeah. Field development proposed a, um, proposed like a monitoring checklist. And I would suggest that that monitoring checklist is, 
some sort of uh, compilation of that daily construction management plan and the results from that monitoring uh, is conveyed to the town in some way. Okay. Um, and that would include, you know, principally dust control and noise control, but also they have erosion control on here. So it really, it's just packaging up their regular reporting in a way that we can look at. Okay. And or, that'll be <laughs> the way right. that you can look at. Right. And so we're, we agreed that um, that will be provided to the town on about biweekly. Yep. Um, and then the only other, the other thing that was discussed too is benchmarking um, on the elevation sidewalls, which uh, Selectman DeCoast just um, brought up as well. Um, so one thing we didn't touch on, Cindy, if, if you don't mind me stepping on your toes here, is the restoration plan. And I want to make sure the, the current settlement agreement, as I understand it, says that the topsoil that's on site won't be removed from the site and field development will provide a $50,000 bond um, in the event that the town needed to restore the site, we would have access then to that bond and to the topsoil on site, which uh, might be thin, but we could probably ultimately regrade the site and spread that topsoil and, and start a restoration effort if we needed to. In other words, if everyone were to walk away, it won't look like a gravel pit indefinitely. Okay. Um, but it, it, my understanding is that's in the settlement agreement and at least the latest version of that that I saw, that was not a point of contention. But I, I do want to make sure that that's the case. Right. That's my understanding as well. I don't know if any other board members um, feel differently, have a comment to the contrary. Okay. And then the other um, thing I wanted to bring up. Madam Chair, before you do, I'm happy to answer the question with regard to the um, uh, to the bond. It is okay. in the agreement. It's paragraph 13 of the draft permit. And that one we, we're good with and we're not working on red line with that one. Okay. Right. So a few different versions have bounced back and forth today. I know, and exactly. I hope you'll forgive me for maybe not knowing exactly which one is the most recent. Right. Okay, so I don't have any more comments on um, the soil removal permit piece of this. Do, do any other board members have any comments on that? I do have some questions or comments relative to the settlement agreement itself. I think while we're on the permit, Madam Chair, we probably should open, since this is in, in uh, hearing mode, open to public comment, now that we've got a proposal on the table. Okay, I didn't know if we wanted to move forward with the settlement agreement. I, I, I didn't want to lose sight of that piece of it. No, no, not at all. Um, certainly, so Mr. Layden, are there, is there anyone waiting to make public comment on this subject? Uh, yes, we have two people. Uh, first, Thomas Connors. Good evening, Mr. Connors. Could you just state your full name and address, please? Thomas Connors. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the, the time that you've given me. Uh, Thomas Connors, 5A Road. Uh, we received a letter from your attorney today. Is he on the call as well? Uh, I know he was uh, he was trying to make it. I'm not positive if he did or not. Okay. I do believe I do believe that he is an attendee. Okay. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think as as I sit here and I listen, I would like to thank Chase and basically anybody that has reached out to the abutters and has tried to listen to some of our concerns. Um, after listening to tonight, it's from my standpoint, it's pretty clear that as I keep hearing how fields development isn't in the mining business, it's pretty clear that they're in the mining business. Um, but I guess if we're going to bifurcate this, um, this agreement, are the, some of my questions are, is, are we going to have the dust and noise mitigation measures in place because I, I can tell you that I was here, I watched them do the noise um, measuring and no, the, the screener was not running. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, can anybody see my screen? If I was to pull something up? 
I can, uh, Madam Chair, I can elevate him to a panelist if you'd like to allow that. Okay. So this is, um, this is for I believe he's been disconnected. Uh, Mr. Connors, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, you should be able to access um, video and uh, screen share as well. Um, there we go. Can you see that? So this yeah, is from my living room window. Okay, and what are we looking at? Mr. Connors, if you could describe the video, please. Well, so basically what it is is um, that's the screening operation. It's probably about 100 feet from my from my residence, from my living room window at the time. Um, that's from inside my house. That was not happening when they did their noise measurements. Um, that, that machine was actually moved down onto the, the entry and exit, uh, entry and egress point, and then it was moved away. So that was not running when they did their noise mitigation or their noise testing. So um, one of my questions is, is are, those, are the noise and dust measurements, are those going to be continuous while they're working or is it going to be a situation where they come in at one point, shut everything down and do, do a measurement and say everything's great? Um, so that's one of my questions. Um, another question that I have is under the, the Selectman Regulations, SR8, it specifically states that um, any removal pursuant to this soil removal permit cannot occur within 300 feet of our dwellings. So if the fields truly are not in a, a, the mining operation or the mining business, then I would request that any soil grading that takes place within 300 feet of, of all the abutters' homes is immediately loaded onto a vehicle, onto a truck, and removed from site. No commercial processing of any soil or dirt or rock should take place within 300 feet of our homes. So that's something that I think should absolutely be within the, the any agreement that the town has otherwise it's a commercial mining operation and they try and say that it's not one so if it's not then they have no reason to, to process all of this soil and all of this dirt within 300 feet of our dwellings and our homes and that in and of itself will probably mitigate a lot of the dust and a lot of the noise that that we have issues with and a lot of the health issues that we have with our children and our homes right now okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Connors. Cindy, can um, I jump in? Because Mr. Connors raises a, a, a useful and interesting point um, that I, I had flagged but had skipped over. Um, according to their the field development permit application, their daily construction management plan, um, monitoring of noise will be as agreed upon. And so I, it, it may be wise for us to define that interval at this time so that everyone is in agreement rather than uh, having this ambiguous language floating out there. Okay. Is, Madam Chair, if I could jump in here as well. Chase, you asked for, and I believe got some clarification on where the processing plant was located, where you asked where the readings were taken from. And, that, and at that point in time, they said that the plant had been moved to the site further away from the residences. To the center of the I site. understood that's, it. That's right. And that's, uh, I would assume that's where we want it, as far away from um, the neighbors and residents as far as the abutters as possible? That's right. And it, we didn't touch on this, but part of the permit defines in a fairly narrow context, the area in which the screener is allowed to operate um, such that it won't, it, that it won't leave the middle of the site, generally speaking, and they may need to move it around a bit. Um, but that was one of the noise mitigation measures. Um, the other is, and you'll note in that um, video from Mr. Connors, that the um, 
a lot of the noise is a function of direct line of sight impacts. Um, and that's why tech environmental measured noise at the top of the berm and at the bottom of the residential side of the berms. And what they showed is that the berming mitigates noise pretty effectively. However, I'm receptive to the idea that um, not everyone, not the totality of everyone's house is protected by a berm, right? The second story might be above the berm, which is why I was asking for further mitigation of the screening hours. But, um, but yeah, it, to answer your original question, it was, my understanding is based on Tech Environmental's report, the screener was at the center of the site at the time that they were doing the noise monitoring. And I don't, I was home when they did that. And I don't recall that ever running while they were doing their, their measurements. Okay. Um, they do note a, a, a meaningful increase in noise when it's operating. It's still within town bylaw requirements, but um, something was certainly operating at the time that they took their measurements, quotes with excavation operations. So let me ask this, is there any reason that the screener could not remain in the middle of the site? Their the application says it will. Wasn't, excuse me? Their application says it will, plus or minus a, a small degree of uncertainty if they need to move it. Okay, so just um, based on Mr. Connor's video, it was in close proximity to his house, but I'm not sure when that, um, when the video was taken, but is there any need that that screener would have to be relocated to the spot um, reflected in his video. Madam Chair, no, the, the intent is the screener has been relocated and uh, in response to concerns raised by this board and by the abutters, it has been relocated away from the property lines and it will remain there. As uh, Chase mentioned, it may need to be relocated a bit within the site depending on what, what is being worked on but it will remain as far away from the, the property lines as possible. And one thing I, I wanted to alert the board to is an opportunity that we have to remove a significant amount over half of the materials that we're talking about without any processing taking place on site. I think um, we'd advised members of the board that uh, Tewksbury High School has has made a request and has approved a sample of the, the earth materials and would commit to 80,000 cubic yards immediately if we can get um, the approval to move forward. They're at a, unfortunately, on a timeline, but if we can get approvals, we can begin with this immediately. It will require no on-site screening, which would um, do two things. One will decrease impacts because there won't be any screening operations to simply be taking it off site. And uh, more importantly, it will also expedite the entire process by enabling us to get this very significant uh, portion of work done th over the summer months and enable us to expedite the entire process. So that's something that we'd very much like to be able to take take advantage of, take advantage of this opportunity and be able to move forward with finalizing um, the development of the site. Thank you, Attorney Platt. So certainly um, through this process, we can define um, as agreed upon with respect to um, where the screener will remain. We've been told it'll remain in the middle of the site, but we can get some more uh, descriptive um, information just to make sure that there's no disagreement going forward about what exactly that means. Madam and Chair, with respect to the, oh, go ahead, David. Oh, oh sorry. Um, so oh. I, I, I don't, I'm not 100%, uh, uh, maybe my age is getting to me. Um, I thought we had submitted a um, diagram, uh, an aerial photograph that specified the um, location of the um, relocated screener, so we can we can certainly give that to the board if um, if, if that hasn't already been provided. I, I thought that we had, but I apologize. We have a diagram of the the previous location and the revised location, uh, Mr. McKay. What it doesn't do it, and might be helpful is put some specific bounds on where the the screener could live 
approximately that, within its new location. That's what I was afraid you didn't have that um, information. And, and we do have a diagram that um, creates a, a red box on the site within which the screener can be located. Um, and I'll, uh, you know, basically just describing that for the board as best I can. I have um, it, David. I have that, it. I can share oh, it. Oh, okay. It's even better. Do, do you want to allow me to share it, um, Joe? You should be able to share it. Sorry. Share screen. So it's this envelope right here that's marked in red. So I think it was up in this area before when Mr. Connors, um, you know, found it very loud from his property. And this was um, the new location right now. Well, actually it's not on site now, but we would like the permission the to, to be able to do it lower, within so. this, as the elevation changes to be able to keep it within this envelope, which we, you know, away from the abutters. Okay. Lower elevation. So okay. On site. Right. Right. Great. Okay. I can, I can email that to, to the um, to Joe or however the best way to get it into your hands. Okay. Appreciate and, that. And, and we can make it easy and just attach that as an exhibit to the permit. Right. So that there's you know not any confusion later on about the you know the wrong exhibit or anything like that. Okay. Uh, Perfect. With the, all of that in mind, I, I, I expect these measures will be protective of the abutters, but I, I still very much want to take a verification-based approach. I'd like to know if the abutter, uh, if the um, the applicants, what sort of frequency with which they propose to do dust or uh, noise monitoring, and I'd also like to know if it, at their next noise monitoring event, um, and then the first event thereafter on which the screener is operating, you could please notify the town. And I'd like to incorporate that into the permit so that we can expect to have a representative from the town there if we choose to oversee and, and understand the noise mitigation measures and noise monitoring. Would it be okay if I address this question? Certainly. Um, so just to give you a little bit of um, information about the noise monitoring, we would certainly volunteer to do it periodically as needed you know maybe i don't know in the beginning we could do it and if we're found to be loud or you know have any complaints because i'm going to be perfectly honest with you it was ten thousand dollars for them to come to do that noise monitoring so i mean it's not i hope not to have to do it you know twice a month if <laughs> if possible but um i just think you know at some point um it's is kind of wasteful if we're if we're testing for something that we're not found to be um, in excess of the local al allowed limits. Um, but you know, at the same time, if, if we are found to have a problem that we need to address, then absolutely, you know, we can address it. Yeah. And Janet, Janet, can I jump in just to supplement yeah. that? Because That's I do want to I do want to make absolutely clear that when when we did this stuff, the sound study, um, the the, the, the sound study was based primarily on two readings. They set the equipment up and they, they, they let, they, they let uh, the equipment record the sound levels and they do that um, monitoring. The technician is actually monitoring that the entire time. And they're trying to establish um, two levels. One level is the baseline of what the ambient background noise is in the area so that while they're doing the sound study, if there is an airplane screaming across the sky at low altitude, they won't include that as, as part of the ambient, um, uh, ambient sound level. But they get a representative uh, recording of the ambient sound levels. And then they absolutely 100% ran the screener when they did the recordings um, and measured the sound levels for what um, the operation was going to look like because we knew that the that the screener was um, an important uh, component to that. So um, I, ju I just want the board to have um, you know to have a certain level of comfort and confidence as we do in the sound study that we've already done and that it did in fact show that um, that the the the, the bylaw requirements um, were met. 
Well, how about this as a, a middle ground? It, my understanding is field development has an opportunity to take 80,000 cubic yards off site without screening. Um, there's no reason to expect that would exceed the noise thresholds with the exception of the backup alarms, which I would not be willing to compromise on anyway. Um, and then there's a, given that that 80,000 cubic yards could substantially change sort of the mitigation environment of all the berming and whatnot, um, that field development does a verification noise monitoring event after that 80,000 yards comes off. When the screener comes back on site and the town is notified of that and we can oversee it with you. Um, but I, I do agree that it, you prob we probably don't need to do it on a weekly basis. That seems reasonable to me. To that. Yep. Okay, so one more um, verification process after the 80,000. Yeah, the next time the screener's on site, removed. really. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right, great. And, and is there anything to that? Like if, if, if found to be compliant or not to be compliant, then this? So if, in fact, the screener's on site and the 80,000 um, cubic yards are removed and it's within the ambient, um, is there another what, what's the end game change is just that one time after the uh, screeners back on site I guess that would be my intent is the one time after the screeners back on site and as long as they meet levels then no subsequent screening if they fail to meet noise levels then they have to take mitigation measures to address those yep. and that could result in subsequent monitoring of noise, right? They have to take the mitigation measure and we have to be comfortable that that mitigation measure is achieving the okay. necessary thresholds. And if I may, um, just as a point of clarification for the board, uh, there may be, the screener may come back before the full 80 is gone for um, screening of other materials. And if it does, we can use that as the trigger for the, the, the um, verification when the screener comes back. Kind of whichever comes first. That makes sense. Madam Chair, could could we get a sense of how long they think it'll take them to deliver the 80,000 yards to Tewksbury? My understanding is that could be done by the end of August if we get our go ahead and, and can commence that project. So it's very exciting to be able to get that much done over the summer. That'll, that'll buy, the time is one of the important factors here and I think that'll, that'll take a big bite out of it. That's great. Right. Yeah, and, so and like, uh, you know, the other, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mr. McKay. Yeah, uh, also our expectation is that the sound and dust impacts will actually get reduced as the project goes on. Um, using the Tewksbury as an example, you know, when, when, when that material is removed, it, it lowers all of the operations um, or, you know, much of the operation. And so that allows us to have, you know, all, uh, you know, in essence, a higher berm um, and the, the work is ha happening at a lower elevation, which, which should um, reduce the noise and visual impacts for, um, for all of the abutters. A again, which was one of the things that, that makes the, the Tewksbury piece, um, you know, an, an important part of, of the project overall, but also I think helpful in terms of mitigating any impacts. The other element that Mr. Connor raised was the applicability of the noise and dust mitigation. And I want to make it perfectly clear that my understanding of the settlement agreement is that those operations are occurring regardless of which theoretical bucket of soil we're taking dirt out of. It, do the applicants agree to that? Correct. Okay. What's, what's in the permit applies to all of the soil removal on the site. Okay. okay, great. Mr. Layton, I understand that we have another um, resident who'd like to make a comment. Uh, yes, George Sanders. Good evening, Mr. Sanders. You gotta unmute, George. Can you hear me now? We can. It's good to hear you, George. Good to yeah, have you thank back. You. Thank you very much there. <laughs> I just wanted to make uh, a few comments, which I had uh, listened about three hours to the zoning board there when they uh, voted to send the motion over to the selectmen. 
Uh, I had a few questions there. Uh, one is that I was wondering why they had to cut the embankment uh, to get up to the property when there was a driveway to the house that was up there when they uh, uh, dismantled that house up there. Why that driveway could not have been used uh, to go up uh, to that property. That's one question that I had. Uh, my other concerns were on the environmental side that uh, I think is uh, very important that uh, the environmental requirements be adhered to uh, by the contractor up there because uh, noise is something that can cause people to lose hearing ability to a certain extent. Uh, the next comment that I had was with regards to the embankment that uh, the nine ruled up. You know, there are times that when um, we can really get a rainfall and we can really have a lot of water that really will come down. And looking at that embankment up there, what guarantees uh, the town has that the water that's coming down will not run across Air Road to the other side where you have the wetland. Uh, to me, I think that uh, there should be some provision uh, within this uh, project that uh, allows the town to hold this contract uh, responsible to ensure that we don't have a problem with water coming off that property onto uh, Air Road. That's my comments, and I thank you for that, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I can take the first and third questions there if you'd like. Certainly. Um, George, your first question is an excellent one because um, I had the same question, and really what it comes down to is, current zoning bylaws versus what would what is grandfathered in. Um, that was long, that road that was up to the previously existing house was put in there a long time ago, um, part of the original Kimball homestead, uh, and is not something that would be permittable now, particularly to access three houses, which is what they could develop by right on that property. Um, if they were to develop those three houses they would have to and use that driveway would have to to have a driveway slope less than 10 percent which is exactly the scenario we're in um so it becomes a grandfather grandfathered in issue versus a, a new development issue uh with respect to your third question and protecting water quality i think the board agrees with you a great deal um fortunately for us the conservation commission has uh has kept a lot of eyes on this site. In fact, they implemented an enforcement order um, that they just lifted a couple, a few days ago regarding water quality and the applicants have uh, improved their water management such that water and sediment is not flushing into the wetlands across the street. So the board of selectmen doesn't need to oversee that because the conservation commission is. Great, thank you. Thank you for that explanation, Chase. Any other comments, Mr. Sanders? Where's he gone? Um, Mr. Layton, is there any other public comment? Uh, yes, we do. We have uh, Jennifer Fife. Sure. Hi, Good Madam evening, Chair. Jennifer. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members. I wanna thank um, everybody for listening to us. I'm at Nine Sleigh Ride Lane. And I appreciate Chase um, taking the time to um, listen to us yesterday as well. Um, just a couple comments and some of the things um, that have been discussed um, with regards to kind of the perimeter of the site to the abutters. Um, there is concern um, from me and um, several of my neighbors here on Sleigh Ride uh, of safety issues for our children. Um, and I know we're talking about noise and, and, and dust mitigation, which I appreciate, but also just as a safety issue, um, some fencing is probably something that I think we 
really should be required at this point. Um, if this is going to be continued, all this soil is going to be removed and there's going to be continued mining going on um, just as a concern and a safe, just as a safety measure. My other comment is I think we have talked about this on several of these calls, but a timeline of what this project looks like and how long this is going to take for the soil removal, for the mining, it, you know, for everything that's going on that's kind of been a disruption. Um, so I'd love to, to know what a timeline looks like and see if a fence um, or some sort of protection, um, you know, for, for the, you know, for the neighbors is possible. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Who would like to speak to the question about the fencing? I could uh, speak to that. I wonder if we could get some sort of a consensus if the abutters would be more interested in fencing versus the landscaping that we proposed. Um, maybe, I mean, frankly, it would probably be less of an investment and less time, uh, less of a time constraint to do fencing versus um, a landscape fence. So yes, we're open to that. Okay. Are we talking about construction fencing while it's operating or are we talking about permanent oh. fencing? Oh. I guess I'm not sure which right now. She wants privacy. Temporary, I, temporary fencing. Well, I'm sorry, what was Jennifer requesting? Jennifer, my, are you still on the call? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I mean, my concern is while the while the project is going on, what's you know, with it's just concerning. There's large mountains of dirt behind my home, and it's just concerning. You know, God forbid, uh, you know, one of the children get you know go back there discovering. It's it's not. It's just not safe. So, what are the protection protective measures you could put in place? Um, to kind of prevent something like that happening. I, I just think there's got to be something to be done. If this is going to be, you know, obviously you've got, you're going to be removing more soil and you're going to be mining more things. So what does that look like? And how do we protect, protect the abutters property? And, you know, so that we don't have any accidents. Okay, so temporary I, it, fencing while the project's ongoing. That's that my concern. Just like what, just protection measures. I, I don't know what you were speaking to about landscaping. If that's after the project is done and what what that would look like, that's fine. I'm happy to listen to see what that talk that is. But I'm talking about while the project is going on, how are we protecting the neighbors, the okay. abutters? So Thank temporary you. construction fence. Yeah. Yep, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we can install. Okay, I mean, and then the, the other question was with respect to the timeline for the project. So we did submit a timeline. I guess probably the abutters haven't had a chance to look at it, but it was part of the package. Right. Um, the, the overall timeline that is a year or less, and we're, we're hopeful that if with the uh, project with Tewksbury High School, that that may help us expedite that, but um, it's the outside date we put in a year from um, permit approval. Okay. And so just to clarify, Attorney Platt, you're uncertain if the project at Tewksbury High School will decrease that um, projected timeline? No, I think it uncertain. absolutely can expedite it. So. Uh, to just help clarify for the board, all of the materials that are coming off have to go somewhere. And the places that they're going, we need to make arrangements with them. They need to test the soil and agree to, to, take, to take it. Um, and so we're trying to line those up. Um, and then once you have those contracts established, then you need to physically load the materials and deliver them. So being able to have a commitment for uh, a large amount with Tewksbury High School absolutely helps guarantee that this project gets moving and completed more quickly. Um, what we don't know is um, the, the remaining pieces and how, whether that's a, 
is it 11 months, 10 months, nine months? So we can't commit to that, but obviously we want this done as soon as possible. The goal is to have three houses up there mm -hmm. that we can then market and sell. It's not to be playing with, with earth materials for any longer than absolutely necessary. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with respect to the agreement, the settlement agreement itself, um, that has been shared with the board. Are there any questions or comments regarding that document? By any members of the board? If, if we've taken uh, input, Madam Chair, I wonder if we should, uh, are, we, are we prepared to close the hearing and go into deliberation on the proposal or do you wanna uh, explore anything? else here beyond beyond the topic if that's the proper, yeah if that's the way you feel we should move forward i'm fine with that uh, unless any other member objects i would i would move then that we close the hearing so that we could uh deliberate on the uh, proposal before us second madam chair there is a hand that was raised i don't it is a individual who's already spoken so i'm not sure if you'd like to take comments again no, I think at this time we need to move on. Um, okay, so a motion's been made and seconded to close the hearing. All those in favor, Mr. DeCoste? Aye. Mr. Glavy? Aye. Mr. Gerbig? Aye. And Cindy Napoli is aye. So the public hearing on the soil removal permit application is closed and we are now going to resume discussions regarding the settlement proposed settlement agreement that has been shared with the board. So I assume all board members had time to review that agreement and I didn't know if they had any initial thoughts or comments regarding it. They wanted to discuss. I'll say it, it has my absolute threshold requirements in it, which is noise, dust mitigation and uh, protectiveness or, or um, a financial assurance mechanism for the town to restore the site if so required. And Ms. Fife just added the, uh, the, the safety measure of uh, the construction fence uh, along a butter's properties or however. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, I think it, we can do that in either mechanism, whether it's a settlement agreement or a soil removal permit. Okay. But, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think we need to review. There was a, a few, um, I'm going to call it contingencies discussed tonight. So we certainly need to circle back and make sure that those are incorporated to reflect the discussions this evening. Um, and there was a, um, so there was no issue with the $50,000 bond that was being proposed. Um, we did receive some guidance from town council regarding um, certain provisions in the agreement um, that they asked the board take a closer look at. Um, and I didn't know if the board had any comments regarding those provisions. Um, one being the amount of earth to be removed um, from the site. There was um, a question of 160 cubic yards, um, that language within the agreement. Are we all in agreement that that is the amount? I mean, assuming we have close to the most up-to-date um, rendition of, of this agreement. Right. You know, the only thing that I, I might offer as an amendment there is up to 160,000 cubic yards, but... Uh, we had uh, a number of uh, billable hours from a couple of different law firms that were going into this agreement. So right. I'm not going to die on the hill for, for that kind of language, but it just, I, I don't see any, any problem with adding um, up to 160,000 cubic yards because if they don't need, if they only end up having to take out 150,000, 155,000 cubic yards, um, they shouldn't be, forced to take out that additional five or 10,000 cubic yards. I think just the up to language kind of eliminates that perception, I guess. I don't know, I could, I could, Tom's on the call enough. 
Yeah, actually, I was just thinking that. I think I'm going to bring Tom into the call. Maybe he can just go through each one of those comments. Um, yeah, because I think there are still some elements of disagreement it. there. Yeah. So, so, and I think we're talking about two, two different things. I think there's the settlement agreement um, mm -hmm. that we're not really quite there yet on. And there's the um, permit. the permit, which recall that the a, a draft permit was attached to the settlement agreement, and we we were I think closer on the draft uh, permit than we were on the settlement agreement. Um, and after tonight's discussion, I I don't know that I think there's there's much disagreement between the parties on what the permit is going to say. So on the settlement agreement, I can go through um, the, the um, kind of the points of disagreement. I guess I, I, I'd also offer to the board, I think the kind of the most important document here is the permit itself. Yeah, so let's move that forward. Well, if we agree on the permit itself, I'm really less concerned about the settlement agreement. You know, if, if we issue a permit um, and we know we're not getting pushback on the permit we issue, you know, we settle, we don't settle, we can kind of withdraw our own lawsuit if we need to. Um, I think we have more options. So I guess I don't want to, I don't want to tussle over a settlement agreement if, if we're going to be able to reach agreement on the permit itself. I guess sense? I it makes sense to me, Tom, it, with the exception of, I guess I would rather do them together or at least get agreement on two of the more challenging parts of the settlement agreement simultaneously. It, you know, I don't want to hold the permit up but for the settlement agreement, but at the same time, I think it makes sense to address them in concert and it's really associated with paragraphs four and five. Right. Um, it, and I, I frankly, I, I could vote on the permit in submitting the permit, but I, I would not agree to the settlement agreement. And given that the settlement agreement, particularly paragraphs four and five, is the mechanism by which we are agreeing to do the noise and dust monitoring, I wouldn't want to do them one without the other. Um, and my real issue is in paragraph four, the the town giving up, um, how, how did Chris put it? Um, flexibility. Yeah, giving up our flexibility to both um, support residents and to uh, bring any other issues forward. I'm perfectly fine not bringing other issues forward in a litigation manner related to the soil removal permit, sure. But I, I'm not willing to waive everything to the extent that it indicates there. Furthermore, I'm willing to not enjoy, to jo I'm willing to not join with a butters in a suit against the fields, but I'm not willing to freeze them out. And so those two to me are non-starters from a legal context, even though the settlement agreement has the technical elements that I think it needs. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, did we, aren't some of the elements of the dust and the noise mitigation, it's addressed in the permit itself anyway, right, on that score. So if, if we vote through the permit, I mean, to what extent is that uh, the settlement agreement even necessary? It's kind of obviated, isn't it? It's, it's I, our, I mean, I guess. The ones who filed it, can't we just withdraw it and be done with it? If we were to bring forward a bunch of the elements of the settlement agreement into the permit, I think that would be fine. Um, and if everybody would be in agreement with that, I, I wouldn't object. Um, but that would have to include all of those protectiveness measures and bonding and so on and so forth. So Chase, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what out of the settlement agreement you'd like to bring forth into the, into the permit. So for instance, in the settlement agreement, that's, that's the article four or uh, paragraph four is where oh, they have the, the, the offending language um, saying that we're kind of giving up all rights for all time. So we don't agree to it. That's not in the, in the permit itself. Um, we I think I was looking at a wrong version of the permit. Oh, uh, crap. It was in the permit at one point. 
or, or I'm sorry, in the settlement agreement at one yeah. point. I, I apologize. I, I just let us down a rabbit hole. We I don't think we needed to go down. You're going up, going up with style, Nick. Hey, uh, here we go. <laughs> More words I can say, the better. Here. So, Tom, how do you advise we move forward? None of which. So, I PM. guess uh, I would advise, and I and um, I don't know that. Uh, so. I think I, I understand what the board wants in the permit. I don't think I'm capable of drafting that as we sit here right now. So I guess I would be looking for a vote along the lines of um, when does the board meet next? The 30th? Technically town meeting. 20, well, Saturday. Yes, Saturday, 13th. So Saturday we could maybe, so we could, you know, I could bring Chris in and we could finish. Oh, oh, no, there's got to be a way we can get this voted tonight. It was just, I mean, we had a draft and a uh, uh, permit and a few items that were the amicably are. worked out between, uh, largely between Chase and the uh, fields right in front of us. And it, you know, it went so well. How could we not be at a point to finish this now? So, okay. If you want to switch gears, you can vote to approve uh, and give Chase. Um, so the board approves giving Chase final say on specific language that, that we will tune up in the next day or so. We don't have the, what you discussed is. Well, the specific we language, okay, that. Tom, specific language, fine. But we can reiterate the points right now so it doesn't become an open-ended question. Yeah, right? that's I fine. Mean, uh, so I, mean, I assume, Chase, you're keeping some sort of notes on the, the, the uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you were taking the lead on that. Do you, do we have oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got thousands of post-it <laughs> notes here. I could reconstruct it. I'm starting to look like you, Paul. <laughs> he does one one oh post. Boy. You don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you already saw the cats walking across the room. <laughs> yeah, he, he gets his weekly appearance once. Yeah. Oh, Marilla. Yeah, I don't think we need a recitation of those things. Okay. We can, we can put them together. Well, we've got a videotape of it, right? So, I mean, if it yeah, comes right. out of the argument, we, uh, yeah. Right. right. I took notes. Chase took notes. And it, it is, um, it is, we have a videotape record. So, I think given that, we can piece it, we can piece together what was um, discussed I think it's VHS. On tonight. All right. Well, then, okay. then, it, would it, then, council and Madam Chair, would it be appropriate to move approval of the, uh, of the uh, permit as proposed with the amendments made this evening? And final wording subject to, uh, or, or final wording subject to the review of town council and selectman Gerbig. Well, it should be circulated to the board, but yes, that, that's fine. We'll uh, give you a final. Uh, that, that's, my, that's my motion. I'll, I'll second assume that as final motion. Second. Can we say the motion again, please? <laughs> Move approval of the, uh, the permit uh, as. Proposed with the amendments made this evening, subject to uh, review and approval by council with uh, Selectman Gerbig's uh, input uh, to be reviewed by the board before it's um, signed. Do you want me to say second again? Please. Second again. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you, Mr. Glavy, for that. Is there any further discussion? Uh, I, I do have one thing to throw in since I'm getting paid by the word here. Um, I think we got backed into this uh, process. It, it, that is that I'm I'm going to vote for it, but only because the, the site is already torn up. And, and the fact of the matter is we're looking at a, a, a selectman regulation, not a town bylaw. Uh, if it was a town bylaw, I don't think we would be able to go forward and do this. But given that um, the site got out in front of itself in the soil removal permit process, we were pushed into a position of essentially having to overrule our own regulations to some extent. And that makes me uncomfortable at best. Um, yet it is where we are and this is the least bad course forward. Um, so uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for indulging that. Certainly. So, yeah. so the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, Mr. DeCoste. Chuck's aye. Mr. Glavy. Aye. Mr. Gerbig. A reluctant eye. And Cindy Napoli is I. How is that recorded? <laughs> One and a half votes. Okay, great. Three so and a half, 
we will uh, move forward as discussed tonight and um, I appreciate everybody's patience and time. Thank you, Chase, especially for um, working with the abutters and the applicants on, on this matter. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. And members of the board, we appreciate it. Sure. Likewise. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So we are on to um, members' updates. Even though this isn't a regularly scheduled um, meeting, I just wanted to um, have an opportunity just to uh, mention a couple of things that are going on. Um, one being the, um, and I'm just trying to pull it up, the um, virtual candidates night that's scheduled for this Wednesday evening. It's an annual event hosted by the Littleton Rotary Club. Um, there's an opportunity for residents to submit questions to the applicants and ask them, ask them questions um, on live TV. So that's an important event. I know if you go to the Littleton uh, Rotary Club um, on Facebook, they have a Facebook page with information about how to um, submit questions and and um, participate in that event. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that we uh, town meeting is scheduled for June 13th. Um, it begins at 8 a.m. We're asking for residents to arrive at 7 p.m. We have put together um, COVID-19 safety precautions um, that will be circulated. Um, they're being finalized and will be posted on the town website, correct, Mr. Layton? And um, we're gonna get that, that information out to the public in anticipation of the meeting Saturday. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Um, they are gonna be posted online tomorrow. Okay, great. Um, How many is Saturday morning? Saturday morning, 7 a.m. is when registration opens and the right. meeting begins at 8 a.m. Did I say p.m.? You did, yeah. Oh, I did? Yeah, it's that, that water you're drinking. Oh, my goodness. If you read the okay. warrant, though, we have all the way until 10 p.m. at night to finish town meeting. <laughs> we yeah, we apparently like changed the start, night. but not the end time. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, got to keep your options open, right, Chase? Yeah. So, <laughs> bright and early Saturday morning, 7 a.m., alumni field. Um, and that was all I just wanted to remind the residents about this evening. I don't know if there's any other... Um, comments from other members of the board. I think that is a no. Okay, so we're going to move on actually, to Cindy. Since since you opened it up, I just want to. Uh, you had you had written a, a, a well written and executed uh, memo to Chief Bernard, and um, just wanted to reiterate the fact that you know there, there's been some trying times in the in the country and. Um, certainly, um, law enforcement is being looked at differently, and, and um, a lot of people are looking to him to find out, you know, what's he going to do. And he, the way he's handled everything has been fantastic, and, and um, he's, he's shown true leadership. And I just want to commend him on that. And I know that you had done it in writing. And I just, I, it's not that we have a huge population watching us tonight, but um, just a shout out to, to him and to all of all of the officers that we support. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up and um, certainly echo echo those sentiments. We're very fortunate to have such a strong uh, leadership in our police department, certainly. So the next agenda item is the use of Littleton Common. And this kind of um, leads into um, speaking about Chief Pennard and his attendance at the um, peaceful rally this weekend. We've, we've been getting, uh, uh, requests from residents to use Littleton Common and looking at our regulations and bylaws um, and other um, town related documents, it doesn't appear that we ever put anything in place, a structure in place for the use of Littleton Common. We have um, some guidance with respect to uh, requests to use Bay Park and requests to use Shattuck Street, but not requests to use Littleton Common. So that was something uh, that I thought we should discuss in light of the requests that seem to be coming in one more frequently um, these past couple of weeks. I did um, draft an agreement and basically I just used the 
um, request to use Bay Park form map um, and just turned it into a request to use Littleton Common. But I didn't know how the board wants to address this matter. Um, if we need an agreement at all, or, or how how the board favors to handle these these types types of requests. Madam Chair, it is something that that this board should have control over. Um, when you first mentioned that you couldn't find it, I swore it was somewhere in our policy because I remember what, starting third Thursday about 10 years ago, uh, my first thought at that time was to make it a business community type thing. And I was told, I thought maybe by Keith, that if, I, if it was a business association, we'd need a permit from the Board of Selectmen, but if it was run by the Park and Rec, we wouldn't. But, and I never bothered checking it. And obviously you didn't find anything, but I... I I was told something was there, but that was an, an erroneous statement, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah, I was surprised I couldn't find anything. Um, so I don't know if the board had a chance to look at the, the document that I put together or if they had any questions yeah. or comments regarding it. I, I don't know, if I, Madam Chair, if I might. Certainly. Yeah, okay. I, um, I, I'm leery of getting... Uh, to, regulate the common in a way that it hasn't prior been necessary, but I would very much not want to start getting into the um, business of interfering with uh, what it would be spontaneous or, or even organized uh, free speech exercises and make any of that stuff require a permit. But if it's, you know, for instance, the garden club annually has their sale and these set up tables when you're actually, you know, putting structures there and, and, and inviting the public in to do an activity, buy something, sign up for something. That's, that's a little more organized and, and structured. I, I would just hope that, that we don't interpret this to mean that if you want to go down and stand on the common and hold a sign for somebody's campaign, you got to get a permit for it or, or whatever. I, I wouldn't support that. And I, uh, I, you know, some folks might think they have to and ask for it, but I, I uh, if we're going to, put a level of regulation on this. I think it, I would be most comfortable with it being um, something that's more towards somebody who's looking to essentially occupy part of the space to, to set up tables or have something formally organized. And I do think the common is distinctively different from some of the other parks where, you know, you, you go there and you're there, that's it. The common is at the crossroads of town. It's essentially a, place to go if you want to spread your message you know or, or right. it's it's bounded by roads on all sides and in the middle and you know you have crosswalks to get there and uh and it's even in the name there it's common land it's you know it's, it's right. supposed to be inviting to the public right no i totally agree i was just thinking more with respect to formal organized advertised adv advertised events i mean we yeah. might want to have some structure to that yeah, um, and if that's the case, yeah, I, I, and I think I think we kind of have informally done that. I mean, as I say, with the one thing that comes to mind annually is a couple of events, whether it's the uh, you know the tree lighting ceremony or the you know, the, the plant sale, right? Um, you know those, those kind of things. Yeah, right. Okay. Any other questions from board members? I know we do. We do have one hand raised. I believe, Mr. Layden. Uh, yes, Mr. Sanders. Okay, great. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just uh, uh, assume that you got uh, uh, public input uh, here. I don't know if it's now, if it's later or whatever, but I want to make a comment uh, at that time. Uh, you can take it now. It doesn't matter. No, you absolutely. Mr. Sanders, go ahead. Okay, uh, when we was on this uh, hearing here, uh, you, you, you asked for within the public input. And uh, I think Mr. Connors or old Connors, uh, he, he, he spoke first there with regards uh, uh, to the public input. But then everybody else started talking. It, it went back to the lawyers and everybody was talking about everything. There, so when the public input came, then when I finally came came on board, there, there have been a whole lot of talking from the time that you moved uh, to that position that take public input. 
uh, just that by waiting so long there, I had forgot one thing that was important. And then when the town administrators say you have one person and one person has spoke, uh, then you said, no, I think we just should move on. I think that was haste in, in the fact to do that because I, I heard very little public input in that hearing. And I thought for you to move forward so quickly like that, uh, and I think that by the, the, the town administrator saying he spoke once, but you let Mr. Connors speak more than once. So I wasn't very happy. I'm not irritated or upset about it, but I just think that when you go to something like that, you either need to let the public make all the comments that you're going to take there and then close it off and move on to it and let people respond to it. Uh, that was my concern. I, I thought that uh, that wasn't fair the way that this was done. So that's my comment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sanders, for bringing that to my attention. And I apologize. I didn't realize that Mr. Connors had been able to um, speak on more than one occasion. And I certainly didn't mean to cut you off um, and not provide you with an opportunity to add further comment. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. And I'll be more cognizant of that um, at future meetings. Thank you. Madam Chair, just can, can I just jump in with uh, something else for public for members' input? Sure. Um, it, it's really public input. I've gotten a, a couple of calls from folks who have um, raised concerns about um, social distancing and wearing masks at the transfer station. And I've reached out to Chris, but I just wanted to um, just let let the public know that um, we're working on it. It's it's difficult to police. Um, but I'll, uh, I will reach out after, after Chris gets back to me and lets me know what, what measures are being put in place. But I just wanted to let the folks that did reach out to me know that it is something that uh, got brought up and um, we, we hear them and we're, we're, you know, obviously we're trying to do the best to keep as many safe and, as possible. And um, as soon as Chris gets back to me, I'll let you guys know when he, when he comes back with as far as those measures are concerned. Okay, yes. thank you. So back to the use of Littleton Common, do, do we wanna, um, are there any comments or questions regarding the document that I circulated? I think we're on the same page uh, with respect to the intent of the document and what we wanna use it for going forward. I don't have the document in front of me, Madam Chair, but if you, if you are comfortable that the language that you drafted um, is is specific to the activities we described and and accepts those other uh, um, you know those types of activity. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we need to add some language there. If you're comfortable as written as is, um, then I have no problem with as long as it's memorialized. If that's our intent, right. So I think it just needs to be revised um, just to spe specify um, organized, advertised. Um, Formal, formally organized and advertised events. I think just to put in that clarification language, I can certainly circle back and insert that language and bring it back to the board, or, or we can just vote on it as amended. Either way is fine with me. Okay. So why don't we just, I'll feel My better one comment, I, just... I guess, Cindy, is that I, um, I, I would change in, Condition three, permit applications must be endorsed by the chief of police, fire department, and highway department to reviewed by the highway department, chief of police by hired. Sorry, I want to change endorsed to reviewed. In other words, it, it, ultimately, the decision rests with the board. I would prefer to be advised by the fire department, police department, and highway department rather than require their formal approval. Okay, so change endorsed to reviewed. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So do we have a motion on this? I'll move that the board vote to approve the application form for the use of the of Littleton Common as amended. Second. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, Mr. DeCoste? Aye. Mr. Gerbig? Aye. Mr. Knox? Aye. And Mr. Glavy? Aye. And Cindy Napoli is aye. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are on to item number six, town administrator. If you want to take it from here, Nina? Thank you, Madam Chair. For the first item, we have the town election warrant. 
Um, I believe that this is a pretty standard process that the board has gone through year after year, obviously. Um, the election warrant was circulated on Friday, I believe. And um, the town clerk intends to collect signatures from board members tomorrow. And we could certainly couple another very exciting um, surprise item for a, a special birthday in town, which Cindy and Diane Dickerson have led the charge on, if the board members would like for both documents to be available when the town clerk stops by to request your signatures. That works for me. Mm -hmm. That's great. There is a, thank you, Judy, quicker than I can say it. Uh, you want a motion then on the, the A there? Okay, move the board vote to approve the town election warrant. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, Mr. Knox? Aye. Mr. Gerbig? Aye. Mr. DeCoast? Aye. Mr. Glavy? Aye. And City Napoli is aye. Um, through you, Madam Chair, the next item the approval for submission of the Municipal Vulnerability Grant submission. I believe we're almost 100% there and would look to the Assistant Town Administrator, Selectman Gerbig or Selectman Glavy on further information there. About half an hour ago, 10 minutes ago, Amy Green circulated to Paul and I a draft grant application right. um, ready to go out. So, uh, Paul and I need to review it. Uh, the CPC uh, fully supported, uh, as in unanimously supported, funding the project contingent upon MVP grant approval. So um, we are, as you've seen, we've had several letters of support come through, including from um, the Horace Mann Foundation, which is really um, interesting because it's a social service organization that's essentially across the street from the Brown property and could really utilize that property for some of its social services programming in an interesting way too. So um, it, anyway, it, it's all coalescing. We expect now we have everything in place and we expect to submit it on June 10th or 11th, uh, subject to final review between now and then. So um, or Amy Green has, has been amazing in this and yes. Joe has been really helpful and, and Cheryl's been great helping us with some of the finance questions. So the town yeah. staff has really stepped up here. Great. Thank you for your work on this as well, Chase. And Paul. M more Chase than me, but <laughs> Good news. It's exciting. I hope it all comes together. And, and to be clear, we are still going forward with the land grant application. The MVP grant could be worth in the ballpark of $800,000 to the town. The land grant is capped at about $400,000. Um, but we still intend to apply for the land grant as well, uh, although that's not due for another month-ish. Okay, great. Thank you. And the next next item, Nina? There is a motion, but I don't think we need it because oh. I think the board's already voted, haven't they, Joe? Yes, they have. Um, one of the reasons why it was just on was in case something changed. If if um, dollar amounts has changed, source, sources change, it was just there to give us a little bit more flexibility. Thank you. And Madam Chair, through you, I would defer to the Assistant Town Administrator for the next one because he's been working closely with the um, property owner for 64 Spectacle Pond Road. Okay, uh, thanks, Nina. Uh, so uh, just giving the board an update since our, our last meeting, I did meet out at the site with the property owner, his contractor, as well as Ed Mullen. Um, the berm has been shaped. Um, we went out there and uh, discussed um, the method of stabilization. Uh, he at first wanted to uh, put in riprap, but I identified that uh, in the, the board's discussion and permit, um, there was no contemplation of riprap and that it was uh, pretty much expected to be um, uh, seeded and it to be grass. Um, they uh, will go ahead and do that. Um, basically what they're gonna do is put down a burlap, burlap 
uh, type material that has grass seed embedded in it. Uh, so it will not only stabilize in case of uh, storms and erosion, um, but then also allow for grass to grow. And uh, may, they acknowledge that maybe at the um, uh, end of summer, so you're talking about September, may have to come back and do additional seeding to make sure that things uh, grow. Since we are getting into summer, it is hard to uh, get grass to grow. Um, uh, did ask uh, the contractor to and the property owner to provide a uh, revised timetable uh, since there's work that needs to be done within the yard as well. Um, uh, and we'll be providing the board with not only that once it comes in, but then also providing the board with, with updates. Okay. So. Thank you for that update, Mr. Layden. Um, so basically, it's it's probably going to be a full year since that was first brought to our attention to, to by, get this matter resolved. By the time grass is growing well enough that we don't need to supervise it, uh, realistically, you're talking into the fall. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And item letter D, please. Thank you. Um, so the screening committee uh, for the Elder and Human Services Director position met last week and interviewed candidates, uh, continued on interviewing candidates. The screening committee has identified two candidates to move forward. We're awaiting uh, confirmation by those candidates before making their names public. And uh, I believe we've received confirmation from one candidate waiting on the other at this time. Um, so additional information will be available most likely next week. Once we, I'm sorry, uh, later this week, um, once we have confirmation. The COA, as an aside, the COA board had wanted to see if there could be a in-person interview for that phase where the individuals came before the Council on Aging Board. Uh, for that interview. And unfortunately, given the number of Council on Aging Board members, specifically nine, and the candidate 10, and the governor's order being 10 or more cannot gather in one location, even if the Board of Selectmen did approve a request by the Council on Aging Board to allow an in-person meeting that was socially distant, etc., the governor's order technically wouldn't allow it because because it would be 10 people. So I, I just wanted to let the board know that that idea had come up uh, by the certain members of the Council on Aging Board who were part of the screening committee. And unfortunately, we couldn't identify a reasonable solution to make something materialize to actually present a request before the board this evening. But just as an FYI, that was that was something that had been raised. So they wanted to, just to clarify, Nina, they wanted to meet them in person when? Just for the, they wanted, the board wanted to see if they could hold an in-person interview for the two candidates who are, who are presumably going to authorize that their names be brought forward. Okay. Because I think the governor's revising that order, correct? I don't have a time on when. I haven't seen information on when. You may have more information than I yeah, do. Yeah, I, I know I read that somewhere. Um, so it might it might know the restriction, the 10 or more um, restriction might might be lifted. I, I thought in the short term, I thought it was when in maybe this week or next week was going to be going to be lifted and revised. So perhaps if the board is amenable to authorizing a waiver, then obviously tied to the governor's order, the board could take a motion to um, permit an in-person meeting, an in-person interview process, assuming the governor's order for his, the maximum limitations of gatherings is, is raised. So this, this in-person interview would be a public meeting by the COA then? Yes. And it would be whether it was in person or virtually, but um, it would be in public. And then in all reality, we probably would offer public, I don't want to say participation because they're 
there wouldn't be a requirement by the COA board to allow pu the public to participate in the interviews, but listen in and possibly even watch by video. Though there are some logistical challenges to that. So I'm thinking it might be listen in only mode. And COA had two members on the selection committee? Three. I mean, I, I don't see a, a problem with permitting the in-person interviews if that's what they requested as long as it is within compliance of the governor's most recent orders. So. Either way, the full board is going to interview the two finalists. That is correct. Since they made that request. Yeah. Good, good time to, you know, we're going to have to start moving in that direction and, you know, let's take a shot at doing it right, having everybody separated and take all the measures. You know, somebody's going to be the guinea pig, right? Yes, yeah, so let's use the at-risk committee. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. Oh, it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Nina, so we should look into that. Um when the governor's orders are expected to change, because I know I read that somewhere. Why don't we just take action pending yeah, whatever right research right. has to happen? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So we have a motion. We need a motion. Chase, you're muted. Do we need a motion, Nina? Is there anything here? That... Yes, because of the board's prior motion to not allow in person meetings except oh, okay. the board of uh, selectors. Well, then I'll, I'll make a motion that we amend that earlier motion uh, pending the uh, guidance from the governor's office to allow for the uh, the in-person interviews for the uh, EHS director's position interview. Second. Something like, something like that. So, something like that, thereabouts. There we go. Motion's been, <laughs> motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, Mr. Knox? Mr. Gerbig? Aye. Mr. DeCoast? Aye. And Mr. Glavy? Aye. And Cindy Napoli is aye. Excellent. Be great to see the candidates and um, get that position filled. Okay, so we're on to minutes. We didn't have any, did we? Did we go? No. I'm in my packet. Second. Good. Okay. There's uh, a motion to adjourn out there somewhere, right? Oh, Maybe I apologize. Um, we do have executive session minutes to approve. We need to be in executive session to approve those? No, unless there are comments, in which case I would recommend they be held until a future. I'd hold them. Yeah. I haven't looked at them. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we adjourn, I want to say goodbye to Chase. Who? Oh, this really this is, is my last his one. His last meet. This oh. is really it. See, well, I tried to extend Saturday. that soil removal permit just to get one more out of y'all, but <laughs> you just weren't having it. But so you'll stick around for special projects, right? We squeeze oh, that out of you at some point. Yes, sir. I think I made that commitment. <laughs> All right. I may come to regret it, but. <laughs> no. That's right. Not. Besides, I got to see this brown land through, if nothing else. That's right. So. Yeah. right. Right. We'll hey, see you at uh, town meeting Saturday morning. That's right. Right. So. To no, I, we haven't actually seen each other in what three and a half months. It's kind of right. Crazy. Uh, I saw you, I saw you down at Long Lake. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fishing. <laughs> Sorry, I came so close with the front end. <laughs> I don't want to know. Okay, so do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, Mr. Knox. Aye. Mr. Gerbig. I don't know. I kind of want to draw this party out. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Mr. DeCoast. Chuck's and I. Mr. Glavy. I am good night. Cindy Napoli is I. Good night. We'll see everybody Saturday morning at Alumni Field, 7 a.m. Stay safe. Take care.